Oh, hello YouTube. Today in the Naughty Librarian, I am going over my end of November wrap up. November was a rough month reading wise. Like, I just went through such a slump and I think it's for a lot of reasons. One being, you know, it was Thanksgiving here in the United States, so it was like a holiday and I was just like not vibing with wanting to read things. I just really wanted to like relax and watch things. You know what I mean? I don't know. I'm just not vibing with reading. Sometimes you go through a slump. I had a November slump, but um, I did read a fair amount of stuff. I have like nine books to go over in this video and all of them are just kind of generally spooky. <laughs> this was like Halloween part two, Electric Boogaloo, because uh, I just went full spooky books again for November. Why not? I could be spooky when I want. Like I realize now I'm wearing like a bone shirt <laughs> today with my holiday background. And uh, it's the least Christmassy thing I could have put on. But you know what? I could be spooky when I want. La la la. But anyway, on that note, let's get into reviewing what I read during November. Let's just start off here with my Anne Rice selections. Um, I read like the True Tales of the Vampires kind of uh, side quest series to Vampire Chronicles. So I read Pandora and Vittorio the Vampire. Uh, Pandora, my whole review of this is already up. You can watch it. Um, it's like a fun little story. I really liked Pandora quite a bit because I didn't know much about her. She's been in other books, but she's just kind of been like a mopey lady who didn't do a lot. And this is kind of her origin story. And like, she is badass and I am obsessed with her. So um, it was pretty fun. I had a good time reading it. It's like very old, old, old story. Like this is like the, it starts in BCE Rome. Like <laughs> it's from a long time ago, but um, I very much enjoyed it. I thought it was fun. I also read Vittorio the Vampire and my full review for this is coming in the next video. So it will be out very shortly. And uh, this one, it's kind of like Vampire Bonnie and Clyde a little bit. <laughs> um, we're following Vittorio. He's like a young noble in like 1500s Italy. And then like he has to go fight like a, like a coven of vampires. And he's like, it's very almost feels YA because he's like 16. And he's like, I've got to defeat the vampire lord. <laughs> so I think if Anne Rice was going to write a YA book, this was probably going to be like her closest estimation. But um, it's, it, I would say it's very R-rated still, but um, yeah, it, it was fun. It's just kind of a story and Vittorio doesn't really have anything to do with any of the other characters we've met. It's just kind of like, hey, here's this other vampire that we don't know who has nothing to do with anyone else. It's like, what, what other vampires are out there? So it's a self-contained little story and it, it was fun. It's fine. So other books I've already reviewed here is The Thistlefoot by Jenna Rose Nethercott. This was my book of the month for my patron and channel member book club. So I've already had a live discussion with my channel members and patrons. It's an exclusive. But um, low key, guys, this is incredible. I'm obsessed with it. If I could give more stars, I would. But I could only give five. So it's getting five. It's going to make my best books of the year list. This is phenomenal. So good. However, that being said, the asterisk here is that I feel like the author's writing style might be an acquired taste. Like I can see why people might be like off put by it, but it's a writing style that I like in several other authors who have like a similar writing style, which are also divisive, but I like. So <laughs> it might just be a me thing. But um, if you also like like Melissa Albert, Victoria Lee, Sarah Gailey. If you like those types of like writing styles, come over here, read this. It's incredible. It's kind of um, like a Baba Yaga retelling, but modern day. And we're following like her descendants, um, these this brother and sister sibling group and uh, the, the Yaga, the Yaga siblings. And they both kind of have magical abilities and it's affected their lives in different ways. And now Thistlefoot is in play, which is the, you know, Baba ha Yaga's mythical house on chicken legs. <laughs> they're, they're living in Thistlefoot. And it's also about more things. Like this book has so many layers to it. I was, oh my gosh, like I hardly ever tab things, guys. And like, look at the number of tabs I put in this book. Oh, it's so good. Um, the, the layers it has, I was speaking about, because it also deals with like a lot with generational trauma and how it affects generations, obviously, but like 
how this one point in history has affected so many other things and reverberated throughout time. And it's in dealing with Baba Yaga and it also deals with like the early 1900s and like the the programs that happened in like Russia, which are basically just genocides. And so there's some very dark content in the book as well. It, like now that I mentioned the programs, like obviously, but um, wow, it's just so incredibly written. So many beautiful poetic lines in here. I'm obsessed with it. Like whatever this author puts out next, I'm pre-ordering like sight unseen. I don't care what it's about. I'm pre-ordering it. It's going to be amazing. I'm obsessed with this book. <laughs> so please give it a chance. I think it's so good. So many layers. Five stars. Obsessed. Next category is spooky novellas and I read two of them. So like I said, I was going through a reading slump and I just wanted to like get some books read. So I was like, okay, maybe I'll just read short ones. <laughs> and like, it'll get me back into reading. And it kind of worked, honestly. And I read two different ones. I first off, I read What Moves the Dead by T. Kingfisher. It, it is basically a, a reimagining of The Fall of the House of Usher, but like with body horror. And uh, I'll be honest here, I went into this book wanting to love it. And ultimately, I was a bit disappointed. I think it had a lot of cool things going on for it. The problem is the, the premise of the story itself is one I've read at least three other times <laughs> that I can think of off the top of my head. It's kind of a, a natural body horror zombie kind of thing. And like uh, the girl with all the gifts has a similar vibe. Um, Mexican Gothic has a similar vibe. That's two off the top of my head. There's another one, but I can't remember the exact title of it right now. <laughs> but um, that exact same premise of body horror zombie story, I've read it a lot. So for me, this wasn't anything new and exciting. It was just kind of like, yeah, I've, I've read it done better. <laughs> so I was really bummed out because I really, really wanted to love this. I went in with the highs of expectations. And also, I just like T. Kingfisher on Twitter, like great Twitter page, very funny tweets. So I definitely wanted to read it. But it just says it kind of, I don't know, it flopped for me a bit. It's fine. I can't give it three stars because it's like average. I didn't hate it. Um, it did some cool things with like reimagining this like European country and how like their gender dynamics worked. So that part's cool. Um, it, it's just overall, it was kind of disappointing, but like had a few funny moments and uh, like, I don't know, I'm trying to find like a lot of funny, like fun, good things to say about it. But ultimately, it's just kind of a meh book. <laughs> Luckily, it's a novella, though. So it's like, eh, who cares if it's kind of meh. But um, yeah, I really wanted a lot out of this. And I kind of didn't get it. The other novella I read was Even Though I Knew the End by C.L. Polk. And I was going into this one with like lower expectations because I had read uh, Witchmark by C.L. Polk and was kind of like meh about it. And then I read this and oh my god, am I obsessed with this. This shooting to the stars, incredible. I wish this was longer. Oh my gosh. I hope this is the beginning of a series and she writes more books with these characters. I'm obsessed. It's so freaking good. Oh my god. <laughs> like such a pleasant surprise. It's one of those books you finish reading it and you close the book and you go, hot damn, this was phenomenal. It's one of those. So we're following kind of a like a like a like a 1940s like gumshoe kind of detective story here. And we're following Helen. She is kind of a, a failed mage, I would say. This is like a like a historical reimagining. So it's the it's the normal United States world, but in this world there's also like a mage school and like, you know, the bureaucracy that goes with it. And Helen is kind of a washout from this school. And she is doing private eye kind of work. And, uh, you know, in this world, since the magic exists, the paranormal exists. So you have demons and angels and all that kind of stuff as well. And Helen is hired for a very auspicious case, which is finding the White City Vampire. Essentially, this person's been going around town draining victims of blood and then doing horrible rituals with it. And normally, Helen wouldn't take this case. However, she's taking this case because the person who hired her gave her the opportunity 
to get back her soul that she sold. So yeah, it's like she sold her soul. She's going to have the opportunity to get it back. She has to take it because she's also in love with this woman, Lila. And she wants to stay with Lila and she knows her, you know, her time's come and due where she has to pay up with her soul. So this is a big deal. However, it's a very dangerous case she's been put on. And it's like gumshoe detective, paranormal, sapphic. I, I, like I loved every ounce of this book completely. Like Helen's boss Marlo, I'm obsessed with. Um, she's a demon and she's amazing. <laughs> so there's so many things going on in this book and I am so obsessed with it. C.L. Polk needs to write more books with these characters. I am so obsessed. I hope there's more books planned because if this is a standalone, I would be so bummed. There's so many stories to tell here. And I'm just obsessed. I want, I want more. <laughs> it's so good. If I could give more stars, I would. Next category is like spooky YA books. And I read two of them. I finally read Rust in the Root by Justina Ireland. It took me a minute. I meant to read this in October and didn't. And then I read it at the end of November. So you know what? I got to it eventually. And it wasn't that I didn't want to read the book. Like Justina Ireland's an autobi author for me. Is just like, I don't know, I just kept putting it off. But I read it and I loved it, obviously. Um, Justina Ireland also wrote the Dread Nation duology, which is incredible. It's like Civil War zombies. I think if I'm going to compare that book to this book, Dread Nation's probably better. But Rust in the Root is also super, super cool. It's kind of similar to, uh, even though I knew the end, where it's like a historical reimagining where um it's america in the 30s so it's like great depression era but uh magic has always existed and we're following a down on her luck aspiring mage named laura ann and she came to the big city hoping to you know get her mage license so she can practice magic without getting roughed up by the cops essentially and uh not having a good go of it until one day she talks to a unicorn and tells her the unicorn tells her to go to this building and you'll get like in. <laughs> so already there's talking unicorns. There's a lot going on here. And um, it kind of goes into that as well as um, it deals with racism um, and being silenced and also how states of oppression are everywhere, including in the magical system in this world. And it's just really, really cool from a magical perspective. It's cool from like a reimagining of America at this time period and throwing magic on top of it. So, you know, it's the 1930s, uh, Jim Crow law was still in effect. Uh, the Klan was a big presence. There's a lot going on here besides magic. And then like throwing that into the equation, how does it change things? And um, there's a lot of like gory things in here. There's a lot of like monsters and uh, beautiful magic as well. So um, it, I, it, I would say it's it's a bit spooky. Like um, there's some gory bits in here that I was like, yikes. <laughs> but um, I really, really enjoyed it. I think it's really smart. And um, I, I like how it told the story and the perspective of the author was very clear. And I like the this was the the vehicle chosen to talk about uh, states of oppression and how it's like built into the fabric of society. So I think it was a really, really cool like way of telling that story. And I loved it. Um, I think in the end, I gave it like 4.5 stars just because like it, it, there was aspects that could have been better, but um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I love Justine Ireland. I'm buying whatever they put out. They're always so good. I also read The Golden Enclaves by Naomi Novik. This is the big finale to the Skullaman series. And you know what? I very much liked it. I did. I, I like, you know, okay, it's hard to stick a landing, especially when you have a series like this, which is like so large. But overall, I still really enjoyed it. I felt maybe it was a bit too mushy compared to the other books. It had like almost too much heart, which is a weird thing to say, but it felt like an overcorrection because the other books were like so sardonic and had a little bit of heart to them. But um, this one had less sardonic heart. This one had more of a sincere heartfelt moments when uh, I was expecting sardonic more. So eh, it's one of those things. 
but um, we're actually for the first time in this series seeing the wider magical world because um, the Skull of Man series is about a magical school which is not um, a whimsical delightful adventure. This is like monsters live in the walls and will eat the students regularly. Like it is a really rough school and after the events of the first two books where is this going to go? And basically, uh, we're still following Elle as she tries to save the world. However, um, the thing with Elle, she's, she's a nice girl, but oh boy, is her magic just evil to its core. <laughs> she doesn't, she didn't choose to have evil magic. It just happened. So she has to come like, you know, fight against her like evilness because she could very much go dark queen and, and destroy the world if she wants. She doesn't want to but like she has the potential for it. So it's also um, having allies, trying to deal with grief, and also, you know, save the world, etc. And there's a lot going on here. I think like um, the overarching story here was a bit eh, not the best, but overall, I still really enjoyed it. It has all the things that I really loved about the first two books. It's just like parts of it just weren't vibing as well as I wanted them to essentially but overall I think it, it pretty much stuck the landing it's not a perfect landing but they stuck it so um I think it like four stars it's good I enjoyed it it's just not um as good as the other two books I would say but I really enjoyed it it's hard to like give you exactly what this is about considering you know it is the third book of a trilogy <laughs> but um it's cool to see the wider magical world and yeah, I just I just wish it was um I don't know, maybe a tighter story, I guess. I feel like there's too many points going on that are too far apart and we didn't get enough like in the middle, so it feels a little threadbare. Does that make sense? I don't know. It does in my own brain. <laughs> anyway, I liked it. Four stars. The last two books I read were both romance. One is maybe slightly spookier than the other. I read A Curse of Queens by Amanda Boucher. This is kind of continuing on her Kingmaker Chronicles series. Um, the original trilogy is complete. This is kind of a spin-off with um, additional characters that were in the first trilogy. We always wanted them to get together and they just hadn't yet, so they get their own book. And you know what? I was like a little disappointed in this one. Uh, I know, I, I hate that I'm disappointed in it too. I loved the Kingmakers trilogy. Um, it's a fantasy romance. It has the Greek gods in it in a fantasy world. So there's magic, um, the gods are there, um, amongst other things. And we're following Jocasta, which was a character in the original series who was um, younger. So now she's an adult at this point. And she's always been obsessed with her older brother's friend, Flynn who is much older, like 10 years older. So obviously I'm like, they shouldn't have got together then. That'd be weird. Now she's like 24. So it's like, eh, not weird anymore. <laughs> but like, they're kind of finally getting together and they have to go on this big quest to uh, find like an antidote to a curse. And uh, like, I don't know, I enjoyed all of the Greek mythology they wove into it. They're kind of going for like Circe and like looking for Aea, um, her, you know, magical island and all of that stuff. So I appreciated like the story that they wove into this. And I like some of the characters and I like like the snark, but I don't know if it worked as well without our main characters from the first trilogy because our main heroine in the trilogy was Kat, who is like badass and amazing and can do magic. And she's like, you know, the chosen one kind of trope. And this one is Jocasta. And I appreciate the fact that Jocasta doesn't have any magic. She's a normal human. And when she's brave, it costs more than how it would for Kat because Kat has magic. She's probably going to be okay. Jocasta has no magic. So if she wants to be brave, there's like a definite price for this. So I appreciate that. And I like Jocasta as a heroine, and I think Amanda Boucher showed that difference and like explored this character in a better way. I just, it's weird to say this because I know this is a fantasy romance and romance is kind of a big part of the plot. I just wish it wasn't as big a part of the plot. <laughs> I know, it's kind of weird. It's just, I think it took away from Jocasta that she was so pining for Flynn for so long that it kind of weakened her character in a way. 
I would rather her have more conflict there and just focusing on other things rather than like, I'm in love with you. And it felt like counterproductive to some of the story elements. Is that is that weird? I don't know. I think that's like an unfair criticism for a fantasy romance where romance is supposed to be the part of it. But um, it's just how I felt. There you go. <laughs> I wish I wish there was maybe um, a slower burn. Uh, maybe not. I don't know. I don't know. Because I feel like the slow burn is what kind of killed it for me because of all the pining for like at least 60% of the book. Pining. And it was just so much that it was distracting from the story. So I don't know. I just kind of was not vibing with the romance, I guess, which is weird to say, but it's fine. I think I gave it like 3.25 stars. It's a little better than average because I liked all the Greek mythology stuff, but like overall, I was kind of disappointed, honestly, which I'm bummed out about. Last book I read in November is On the Hustle by Adriana Herrera, and I like this one quite a bit. I think in the end I gave it like 4.5 stars. It's just a fun rom-com. So this is Alba and Theo, and Alba, she is like an executive assistant to Theo, and he is like a former Olympic swimmer, kind of very type A kind of person. And she's been working on for a long time and she finally decides, you know what, I need to start living for myself. I need to get out of here and like start living my dreams. So she quits. And at this point, Theo is like, oh no, I really like Alba. How do I get her back? <laughs> kind of thing. And um, what happens from there is a reality TV show where, you know, a, a philanthropist, a money person, has to work with an interior designer, Alba, and do like a philanthropic project. So um, love that. And now they're working together again, close proximity, um, a little bit enemies to lovers. I wouldn't say they're true enemies, but it's kind of that vibe they're going for. And oh boy, oh boy, did this one hit me in the feels sometimes, I will admit, because like Alba as a character is very similar to me in a lot of ways. So it was like, oh gosh, like just like the emotional things she goes through and like how being a workaholic kind of blocks out other problems you have. You're like, no, no, I'm busy working. I don't have to deal with these emotional issues. Like girl, same. <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah I, I really a lot of the story resonated with me quite a bit and also it's very spicy adriana herrera writes excellent spice oh boy love it so it's spicy it's emotionally hard-hitting i rooted for the couple i wanted them to be together it's a good romance this is a nice fun book to read i read it all in one day i just kind of sat on the couch and had me time love it love this book intensely all right, so that does it for November. Overall, I still managed to read a lot of stuff. It's just I was so slumpy <laughs> for so much of the month. Anyway, let me know in the comments down below. Um, I don't know, were you in a reading slump too? Uh, I think in the holiday season, it's easy to get into a slump. Or hey, have you read something really incredible lately? If so, what was it? Let me know in the comments down below. If you like this video, make sure you give it a like. And if you want to see more videos, make sure you subscribe. And if you want cool, exclusive content, including a book club and early access to videos, you can consider becoming a channel member or a patron. The links for that are in the description down below. And on that note, I will see you guys soon. Bye!